So it's my uh, pleasure to welcome Ranjit Jala. He's uh, Ranjit is a professor at the uh, University of California in San Diego. He got his PhD. Um, <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, he got his PhD at UC Berkeley. Uh, he's advisor of some history. And uh, you know, during his PhD, he, he came up with this uh, abstraction refinement systems called GLASS, which is a very famous work in program analysis. Uh, and since then, after that, he moved to UC San Diego and he's been doing very interesting work on combining uh, traditional type inference, like Hindley Milner uh, type inference, with uh, classic program analysis concepts. So, so then you tell us about this. Can I borrow your uh, thing? I, I wonder if you guys. Thank you. That's the. Uh, yes. <laughs> charge you like a billion dollars for this man. Updates ready to install, just like Windows. <laughs> Why do we even bother? Okay. Okay, thank you, Martin. I am uh, very, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, this, doc, this talk is gonna be a bit of a change of pace, I think, um, from a lot of the other things we've seen today, because I'm gonna, it's, a, it's essentially a very high-level tutorial. Think of it as a kind of graduate 101 kind of lecture on this line of work that I've been doing, but which actually builds upon and is very uh, dovetails very nicely with a bunch of other work that a lot of people have been doing over the last few years, including Vijay. He sort of very briefly alluded to this, uh, to this dependent type system that's inside constraint, uh, inside X10. Okay, so what, what is this work all about? Um, what I care about principally um, is algorithmic verification, okay? So what I want to be able to do is to prove properties of programs more or less automatically, right? With very little work. So without the programmer having to write a lot of stuff down. Um, so here is, so what do I mean? Let me give you a very, very concrete and classic example. I'm hoping no one's gonna have trouble following this, right? So here's a really simple function. You don't need to run JS nice on it, I hope. It's not that it's not that bad. Min index, it takes an array, it just loops over the array, tries to find the element with the smallest index, right? Initializes it to zero, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm just giving you a very, very canonical example of the kinds of things you might want to verify, even if you are a JavaScript programmer, that these array indices are within bounds, right? So it's just a kind of standard thing. So A of I, A of min, how do you check that they're within the bounds of the array? Why is this not working? Um, Okay, so we pretty much know how to solve this problem. And we've known about it for a long time. Somebody, let's just say, uh, you know, if you were Peter, you would, you would write down these little invariants. You would say at, you know, this is a little loop invariant. You would say i is between a dot, you know, between zero and a dot length, same for min. And then, you know, we've had these wonderful things called program logics, which will take these invariants and will check for you that in fact, yes, they are invariants, right? These symbolic execution, program logics, SMT solvers, et cetera, et cetera. What you get at the end is you have an invariant, you have your program, the, the, the program logic generates what is called a verification condition. I'm assuming everyone here is quite comfortable with this, with this terminology. And it ships it off to the SMT solver that either says yes or no, okay? If you don't have invariants, right, so if you, if you don't want to write invariants down, we still know how to deal with this reasonably well, which is um, we throw some kind of inference or synthesis or abstract interpretation or data flow analysis at the problem, right? So um, what we know is that the, these invariants are really what are called fixed points of the reachable configurations of the machine at, that, at, at each program location. And you can compute them via various data flow analyses of the kind that Peter gave a, an excellent example of yesterday, right? You, or, uh, or Anders, for that matter. Okay, so all of this is pretty much well known. Um, you know, logic and ana analysis are kind of the backbone of a lot of the work that we've been doing over the last, I don't know, four or five decades in the programming languages community. You can specify properties with these little predicates or assertions. You verify properties essentially using some kind of symbolic execution with ver verification conditions. And you can actually even infer, infer or synthesize these properties using fixed point computations. So what's the problem? Why am I here? Is this kind of a done deal, right? So this is the kind of thing I was working on in my PhD dissertation, various you know, improvements upon this basic technology. But what we found again and again is that this works reasonably well, except for it, it hits a wall. It, it works very well up to a point and then it hits a wall. 
And I'm going to, you know, as a kind of cartoon, I'm going to call this wall, quote unquote, classical programs. Okay, so take take my, I put, I put air quotes in the slides, okay? So uh, what do I mean by classical programs? What I mean is, um, this, this is what I mean, okay? So a classical program basically is your standard imperative program. You have assignments, branches, and loops, right? For while loops, for loops. Um, if you're feeling really wild, you might throw in functions, right? Um, you will throw in functions and add recursion. And it's only over the last 10 years or so, where actually a lot of the work has been done by Peter Mueller and his colleagues, where people have even started looking at how you might extend these ideas of in-program analysis and program logics to deal with things like class invariance and object invariance and inheritance. And it's, it's, it's quite a tricky problem. But, so what is not a classical program, or well, I would say actually Vijay gave a very nice example um, just a moment ago of programs that start using more interesting control constructs. Okay, and they're all essentially, they're highly inspired by functional, by functional languages. So what I call, I'm just gonna call them quote unquote modern programs. Or what actually um, the famous Swiss computer scientist Martin Odersky calls, I really love this term, post-functional. It's a really an excellent term in my opinion. Um, so there's aggressive use of just containers, right? Modern languages like Python just build really useful data structures right into the language up front. So arrays, dictionaries, hash maps, so on and so forth. Um, polymorphism, generics, type classes, various kinds, various notions of polymorphism. Pretty much every modern language has this built in. Um, and then of course, the, the backbone of all of this is higher order functions. Callbacks, you can call them callbacks, things like maps, reduces, filters, events, all of these are just instances of higher order functions. Uh, I guess all of you saw, you know, even C++ has lambdas now. I should say not even C++, even Java has lambdas now, right? So it's not just, uh, it's not just these weird niche languages from a long time ago. They're, they're really as mainstream as it gets. So here's a modern variant of that exact same program, right? And this is pretty idiomatic JavaScript or whatever this funny language is that I'm using. Um, actually, this is working JavaScript. I tried it out. So here's min index. And you have that same array. That's, not a list. that's right. There's no <laughs> such thing as a, that's right. Yeah, define downwards. Um, <laughs> exactly. That's an excellent point. It, all, it always works. Just get undefined. <laughs> um, so you have that same array, but instead of looping over it in the classical fashion, what we're doing is reducing over it in the modern fashion. Okay, so I'm not going to show you the implementation of reduce. You can imagine what it is. But the reduce function sort of you know, stripes over the contents of the array, and it takes as input a, a higher order. Uh, it takes as input a function called body. It's essentially the loop body. The body has some in you know has the current minimum. Sorry, what is the, this is the current minimum. This is the current value. This is the current index, and it does this little computation that updates the minimum. Right. So I've just taken the loop body, hoisted it into a lambda. Actually, JavaScript does not have. La oh, it does have lambda, but it's really ugly. I tried formatting it, and it's doing exactly the same computation. But now, how do I show that the array indices are within bounds? There's, it's like there are no, there's no loop over here to start with. Um, so I, I mean, I can't really talk about a loop invariant. And if I start thinking about the way values are flowing around, it's pretty, it, on the surface of it, it seems really complicated. What is V? What indeed is V? Oh, damn it, it doesn't work. I knew I shouldn't have. <laughs> this is what happens when you, uh, this is car. My, yeah, okay. This is the PowerPoint, okay. It's the current value in the that we're reducing over, right? So maybe I should have C U R R, right? It would have, <laughs> or maybe not, because it was not actually minified from a valid program. Um, should I, okay, good. So so far so good. So excellent. Thank you for correcting me. This V is is is, is this guy, right? So if this value is less than the current minimum, oh. good. So the trouble here is that the control flow is pretty convoluted. And the techniques that we were working with that worked so well with, um, you know, with the classical programs, just, uh, we just like, we are, well, we, we won't deal with higher order functions and we won't deal with code like this. But of course, now code like this is everywhere. You can't, you can't, you, you can't just say we're not gonna deal with this. This is increasingly how programmers write code. And this is, a, you know, a lot of the stuff that Anders talked about yesterday has the same flavor. A lot of jQuery code actually looks like this, right? So there are lots of these JavaScript libraries. Uh, another very popular one is called D3. Um, which stands for data-driven documents. And the really cool idea in D3 is that you can associate lambdas with the elements of, of your web page, right? And the idea is that the lambdas then update the way that the web page is, 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 is rendered. 
Um, yeah, so how do we deal with all of these? And this, this is essentially the problem I was stuck with. And so what we've been working on for, the several, for, for several years now, a very long time, it feels like, is can we extend this sort of classical technology, which is logic and program analysis, with type systems? Okay, and that's what this talk is all about. Um, how do we use type systems to address all these, all these sort of modern programming constructs? Okay, so can we use types to lift logic and program analysis to this, to this new, this brave new era, as it were? And in a nutshell, let me just give you a sneak preview of what's going to happen. Um, what's going to happen is that we'll see how various notions that we knew before just get generalized using types. Okay, so what I'm going to say is now, instead of specification just being assertions or predicates, I'm going to now take those same predicates and add them inside types. Verification used to just be verification conditions checked by SMT. What we'll see now is that verification becomes the same VCs combined with a very simple form of subtyping, just classical subtyping. There's, there's really nothing fancy going on. Um, and finally, what inference becomes is a combination of just classic old-fashioned abstract interpretation with type inference. Again, classic old-fashioned type inference. But hopefully I'll be able to convince you that um, you know, shifting your point of view to accommodate types as, this, as a special object instead of program points, the program counter, actually leads to you know, very interesting ways of thinking about um, specification for programs. Yeah. I, yes, thank you. I didn't even use the word, but it's, oh, I did, in fact, right there. When I, that's a good point. When I say types in this talk, do I mean refinement types? Mostly I will mean that. Up to now, I have just meant old-fashioned types. <laughs> ah, funny you should ask that. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so what indeed is a refinement type? It's, as I said, it's simply going to be a type plus a predicate. Um, so here's the simplest possible refinement type. Okay, it's, and this is all working code, so I, I know there's no typo here. So it's a value that's an integer such that some predicate holds, right? Value equals zero. This is the simplest, sort of really dumb type, but essentially it defines a subset of the integers that satisfy this condition. And of course, there's exactly one integer that satisfies that condition, which is zero, okay? So now I might say that in earlier, oh, by the way, I'm also switching languages now. We're not talking about JavaScript. Everything is Haskell from now on. So um, how do we say in the US, deal with it. <laughs> so, uh, um, so, here, so, here, so while earlier you might have said zero is of type int, I can now say zero is of type zero, right? The, you know, it has the value zero. And I could, you know, if I was to change the zero to 10, I would get a type error, right? Because 10 is not of type zero. In fact, Shall I be so brave and, in fact, just show you such a type error? If I can find one of these myriad windows is my Emacs window. Oh, Lord, how do I blow up the fonts? Very, very hard. I can't do it. Uh, I won't. Okay. Okay, so the refinement types are just going to be the things inside these comments. So let's look at, you know, let me describe slightly more formally what a refinement type is. We're going to have vanilla types decorated or dressed up or refined with predicates from a decidable logic. And this is pretty important to me but not so to other people. Okay, so um, this logic is essentially, for those of you who know what it is, it's a quantifier-free fragment of uninterpreted functions and linear arithmetic. For those of you who don't know what it is, here's what it is. Expressions, you have variables, x, y, z, you have integer constants, 0, 1, 2, you have addition, subtraction, multiplication with a constant. These are all pretty boring. The one I really like is actually very, very simple, but we'll see it packs a lot of fudge. This, it's called an uninterpreted function. Okay, so f applied to a bunch of expressions. And we'll see where these come up in the fullness of time. Okay, and then you have predicates over these. So, um, so you might have simple comparisons and or not implies, et cetera, et cetera. You will notice that I leave out for alls and exists because I, those are not my favorite things. Okay, so refinement types are then, uh, you just have basic types like integers, booleans, type variables. And then you have base types, so x is of type whatever, int, bool, string, mumble, such that some predicate or you have a function type, okay? So x is, a, so this, this describes a function that takes a parameter x, which is of some type t, and returns some other value that is also of some other type, some other type t, right? And the key point is we'll see that this output t can refer to the input, and this way we'll have post conditions talking about preconditions. So let's look at some examples. Um, actually, before we do that, let me just tell you a little bit about the basic machinery we're going to use. So I'm gonna use a subtyping judgment that looks like this, gamma, is going to describe all the variables that are currently in scope, and t1 and t2 are types. So what this says is that in some current 
at some current place in the program, some context, the type T1 is a subtype of T2. And um, the way we're going to decide subtyping is by using verification conditions, right? So this is where it hooks into SMT. So the environment is going to be a sequence of binders. So X1 has some type T1, X2 has some type T2. And, um, and then the subtyping is going to happen as logical implication. Okay, so imagine I have a, a condition like this. So, you know, maybe you, you guys are all well up on your popple papers and you can read the numerators and denominators. I'm making it very explicit with an if then. Okay, so if you want to show that in this environment, this type is a subtype of this type, then what you have to prove is that when I conjoin all these predicates pi and q, then it implies r. Right? So this is very much just a verification condition if you think about it. Right? This says that the set of things described by q in this context is in fact also contained inside the set of things described by r. Okay, so let's look at some simple examples. So nat is, uh, so nat is now all the values that are greater than zero. Um, and so now, I know that zero is a subtype of nat simply because v equals zero implies that v is greater than zero. Right? It's pretty straightforward, it's nothing very exciting. And so you can type zero not just as the single, single type zero, but as all natural numbers. Okay? So that's just a very simple example. Okay, um, so what I'm doing right now is just showing how you, you know, first, before you can get to the fancy stuff, you have to be able to do the simple stuff, right? So I just showed you simple values, then I'm gonna show you function, fun how function types are like your classic pre and post conditions. OK, so the way we get free and post conditions is with function types. And here's a very simple example. Imagine I want to write a safe division operator. OK, it takes a numerator n and a denominator d. And I want to, you know, it returns n divided by d. But this is going to crash if d is equal to 0. So I want to specify as a precondition that d should not be 0, right? So the way I would do that is I can, so by the way, every time I do these things, it's just to save myself a bit of typing, right? This is just a type, a type alias, so that I don't have to type all this stuff out. It's a little prettier to see non-zero instead of the whole, uh, the whole thing over there. So I would say type non-zero is the set of values that are not equal to zero. And then safe div is simply give me any integer, give me some d which is non-zero, and you get back an integer, okay? Um, so you might, here's an example of how you might use safe div. Um, if I call bad of n, bad n is 10 divided by n, where n is an arbitrary nat, then the type checker does not like it. That's why it's colored in red. Um, because, well, if it's a nat, it might be zero, right? And so if I fix it, okay, so if value is equal to n and n is a nat, it does not imply that value is non-zero. But I can fix it, you know, for example, by just replacing it as n plus one, and then it's all fine, right? Because it's guaranteed to not be zero. Okay, so I'm hoping everyone is following everything so far. It should be completely straightforward, right? There's, there's, there's nothing complicated. Maybe I should pick up the pace a little bit. Okay, um, here's a slightly more interesting example. Here's an absolute value function. It takes x as input. If x is greater than zero, returns x. Otherwise, returns zero minus x. I might show a function contract for, for abs that looks like this. It takes x as an integer and returns some value that is greater than x, right? So this is a post condition where the refinement is on the out. What's that? That's exactly, what did I say? The, I always leave out the or equal to when I'm speaking. Good thing I have a fancy type checker, isn't it? Um, yeah, it is in fact, uh, it is a greater than or equal to, right. Okay, um, okay, good. So everyone, I hope, I, I hope you now know what basic refinement types are, right? So let's look at slightly more interesting examples. So again, maybe you, know, you can step through this. The reason this all checks out is it's just doing the same floyd Hoar VC style thing but expressed in this typey format. What's happening is really there are two, two places where values get bumped out, right? This x and the zero minus x. If you think of this x, x is an integer, the computation is returned under a guard where x is greater than zero, so we're returning the value that's equal to x, and we want to prove that it's a nat that is greater than or equal to x, right? So that's the subtyping obligation. And down here, the guard is x is not greater than or equal to zero, it's the else branch, the otherwise. And here we're returning the value zero not equals to x, and again, we want to prove the same thing. We get these two subtyping obligations. Both of these reduce to the ver these verification conditions, right? You strip out all the type crap. You just get this nice logical formula. And both of these hold, and so everything is fine. Okay? So, so far what I showed you is just how, you know, your standard floyd Hoare style program logic with pre and post conditions and so on, um, get, you know, can be sort of moved into this typey realm. 
Okay, next let me give you a very, very fast overview of how abstract interpretation works in this realm as well. Okay? So how do we infer signatures from code? And really what we'll see is a very, very small tweak on what we've been doing so far. It's gonna be a two-phase process. We're first gonna use the languages type system to give us the basic types. Okay, or the, how, do I, how did I say it, the unrefined types. And then we'll just figure out what the right predicates should be using abstract interpretation, okay? So let's quickly look at two. I'm not gonna tell you how Hindley Milner works. If you, if you know it, that's great. If you don't, the loss is all yours. <laughs> um, you should know it, no, seriously. It's, I mean, it's one of the greatest algorithms in computer science. Okay, so here's the recipe. It's quite straightforward, and in fact, it's very similar to the, you know, it's very similar to the, the general sort of synthesis and inference recipes we've seen in many other places. In the first step, what we're gonna do is, um, whenever we have a refinement type that we don't know what the predicates should be, we don't know what the refinement should be, we're gonna make up these little k variables that describe the unknown refinement, okay? Then step two is, we'll just pretend we knew all the types and do all the type checking. Okay, so I don't have the concrete, I don't have the real invariance, I'll just use these k's and I'll, I'll do the type checking using the k's. And as a consequence of doing the type checking using the k's, what I'll get is again those subtyping obligations, but now the subtyping obligations will have these little k's inside them, right? And then what we'll see is that the subtyping obligations with the k's inside them, essentially if you squint the right way, just become little constraints over the k's, which you can then solve via abstract interpretation, okay, and the usual classical stuff. Okay, so let's just look at our old friend abs and see how it all works out. So here was the vanilla type, right? If I just run GHC or really any half decent language, it would tell you that it's a function that takes integers and returns integers. So I would just say this is the vanilla type. And I don't know, what should, does it take positive numbers? What is the output? I have no idea. So I'm just gonna make up these variables K1 and K2 that describe the unknown pre and post condition. And then what I'm gonna do is, I'll just do my type checking using the K1 and K2 instead of the concrete values that I had. And when I do that, I'm gonna essentially get the same subtyping constraints I had before, except I'll have these K1s and the K2s, right? In, where earlier I had some concrete predicates. And now when can I just take these subtyping queries, when I strip away all this nonsense, the VCs look like this, okay? And now we're pretty much home and dry because this particular object that we see over here is, um, is you know, if, if you look, think about it carefully, the Ks all occur positively, and so this is really a data flow constraint over the Ks, okay? And it can be very formally thought of as such. It's what various people have started calling uh, a horn clause constraint. If you flip this around, where is Mayur? You can think of this as data log, but with you know, the implications going the wrong way, right? Um, and so now it becomes quite easy to solve this via fixed point computation, just using your favorite abstract domain, right? Um, so my favorite abstract domain is something called predicate abstraction, where somebody gives you a conjunction of predicates from some finite, somebody gives you a set of ground predicates, which might look like this. Right? Um, so they're of the form C squiggle X, uh, where C you can think of as various constants, zero, one, two. This is very much the kind of thing, say, Armando likes as well. Um, so C is of the form zero, one, two. X are various program variables, right? So N, X, V, P, Q, R, whatever, right? In, in, the, in our system, the way you literally write this X is as a star. Just fill it in with whatever program variable you like. Not very different from the way um, Sketch works. And then squiggle is, you know, your favorite set of operators. But you can go on, right? This is, you can make up whatever family. You can have some random regular expression of these predicates. Um, and then what's gonna happen is that we will sort of do a least fixed point computation using those horn clause constraints and solve out the K1 and K2. And if you don't like my favorite abstract domain, you can use your favorite abstract domain. We, we show in a very precise sense in this particular paper, that's a hyper rep, if you, like who knows what HMC means. Um, that you can pretty much plug in any arbitrary abstract domain and, and solve those and get the case out. Okay, good. So now what I wanna show you is that this was a really trivial thing. We had this funny little abs, it was a very simple function. But in fact, this exact same recipe, by virtue of the fact that we're sitting on types, is gonna scale up to handle quote unquote modern programs. Okay, so once I give you my type checker, I'm gonna get an inference algorithm for free and this just pretty much just works out of the box for when you have collections and higher order functions and polymorphism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So let's look at collections. How am I doing on time? I'm way over time. Okay, so collections were the first thing that, um, the first thing that bothered me a lot because the moment you wanna talk about the, the contents of data structures, you had to get in that nasty universal quantifier, right? So if I, if I wanna say here's a list of values all of which are in some range between zero and 100, 
then I would have to say for all x in this list, it's between 0 and 100. And the moment the for all comes in, unless you're Rustin Leno, you don't really know what to do with it. Right? So Rustin, Rustin is like the SMT whisperer. Right? He knows exactly how, <laughs> how to get um, SMT solvers to deal with for alls. But I, for the life of me, have always found this to be quite a, a, a black art, a mysterious art. So instead, what I want to do is to get the type system to do all of this work for me. Okay, so let me show you how that works. So here's a, I'm just going to define sort of self-contained. Here's a list. So a list is either the empty list or a cons of some A and a you know, tail, which is a list of A's, right? And now, how do I specify that every element in this list is non-negative? So this is just the list 0, 1, 2, 3, whatever, right? I miss, okay? How do I specify that every element is non-negative? Well, at this point, you can figure it out. It's pretty obvious. The way I would specify it is, uh, you know, if I was in logic, I would have to, you know, I would have to define all these different things, right? What does in nats means? But I would have to have some form of quantification. But if I'm in the types world, it's completely obvious. I just write this. It's a list of nat, right? When nat is that same, it's that refined integer, and now this l thing is what's doing the quantification for me, pretty much for free, right? I, I don't have to, it's, it's so trivial, I don't even have to think about it. Um, but what's nice is that it works very nicely in an algorithmic way, right? So as I build up the list, I'm going to get this universally quantified invariant. And as I start destructing the list, I get to instantiate that fact also uh, pretty much automatically. Okay, so let's see how this works. So how does the type system sort of do the math? How does it, how does it do the quantified generalization and an instantiation to figure out that some list L0 in fact has this property that for all x, x inside the list is a nat? Well, L0 is, let's just say, 0 cons L1, 1, 1 cons L2, 2 cons L3, where L3 is nil. And now it's just, it's just the type system doing its thing. Nil is a list of anything, so well, it can be a list of nat. 2 cons L3, well, L3 is a list of nat, 2 is a nat, nat cons list of nat is a list of nats, et cetera, et cetera, right? You just work all the way up. The type system's just doing all the work for you. It's, it's, it's completely syntactic. OK, let's look at a slightly more interesting example, because nats are not the most exciting thing on the planet. Suppose I want to write a function called range that takes, uh, takes i and j, right? this is like the Python function, takes i and j and returns a list of integers between i and j. So it would look something like this. I, I might describe a type that looks like this. Type between i and j. It's a list of values. I'm dropping the int. It figures it out. List of values that are greater than i and less than j. right? And now. Um, here's my range function, range i and j. It's just a recursive function. It's looping happily. Uh, it starts off at i at 0, and then as, you know, this is a loop, and as long as n is less than j, it returns n cons and so on and so forth, right? And here we go. I can just say i is, i is an integer, j is an integer, and it returns a list of values that are between i and j. And it'll just synthesize all this quite easily. Yeah? Ah, it's just the usual list, nil and cons. That's it, and so the C is cons and N is nil. It's a type definition. Yeah, okay? The between is the thing that I've done as this funny refinement, but L is just our old-fashioned, I could have just written in, 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 the, in the other style, right? Okay, um, so I mean, one of the things I do want to show you is that notice there is a little recursive function over here, and the system actually pretty, you know, it automatically figures this out using those Ks, how, what, the, what the different, uh, what the pre and post conditions are for go. So that's quite useful because otherwise um, it will be quite tedious. Yeah. Which list do we see? That's a very good question. It's a very, very good question, but let's take it offline uh, because it's a, it's a, it has a somewhat long answer. So good it's offline, yeah, I, I cannot, this, the answer to this question cannot be fit in this small space, but, but please do ask me about it, I'll tell you about it. Okay, so here's another well. So of course the other thing you do with containers is not just put values in them, but often I want to know is it empty, is it not empty, so on and so forth. And so returning to my old array indexing example, let's look at list indexing, right? So here's how I might write a function that takes a list of A's, it takes an integer, seven, and wants to return the seventh element in the list, okay? So in order to make sure that my function is, is OK, I want to make sure that, well, if, if the index is 0 and the list has you know, some head element, then I return the head. If the index is some i, then I recursively look up the i minus 1 as element in the tail. Right? This is just really simple rec recursion. Otherwise, I die. And I die means that you ask for the fifth element in a list that has only two elements. 
right? That's, that's how you get this pattern match error. Functional programming people always have this, they, they always like to say, oh, there are no null dereference errors in functional languages. That's just rubbish. It's called a pattern match error. Yeah, sure, there's no null dereference error because there's no nulls per se, but they just, they call something else. Um, so how would we show that, for example, over here, this particular error never happens? We would have to somehow say that this number, the integer over there, is, bet is between zero and the size of the list, right? So I would need some way of describing the size of the list. And so let me show you one of the you know, nice mechanisms that we have of describing the size of the list. Hey, how much time do I have? I started like 10, 15 minutes late. Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay. So what we do, this, is, this turns out to be a quite a, you know, it's, it's on the one hand, it's a bit of a hack. But on the other hand, it's such an invaluable hack that I feel I should tell you about it. It's an incredibly useful hack. Okay, so it's, uh, we, we call it measuring the size of a data structure, or essentially what we're gonna do is let you write recursive functions over the data structure, and then use those recursive functions inside specifications. Okay, so um, what have we done so far? I've told you about basic refinements. I've told you just how vanilla subtyping works. Now let's look at how you talk about the, these sort of structural properties. So remember, this was our data structure. What I'm gonna do is, we can define a, a, a fun in fact, now we can do it without these pesky comments, but it's just a little recursive function that takes a list and returns an integer, right? So ln zero cons one plus the length of the tail is what you expect. And now what's gonna happen is that by virtue, and again, we're using the type system here very, very aggressively, okay? This is again a kind of universally quantified fact, but what I'm doing is I'm taking that type definition, and what I'm saying is that you can strengthen the types of the data constructors. So the nil constructor now additionally gets the type that the value that you get has length equal to zero, and the cons constructor is a function that takes a head and a tail and gives you back a list whose length is one greater than the length of the tail. Okay, so all I'm doing is I'm taking those recursive functions and packing, what, packing their source inside the types of the type constructors. And by doing this, again, the type system is gonna do all the heavy work for me. Okay, it's gonna just, like everything just works like butter. Okay, so um, ln is, oh, by the way, I should have mentioned this. This is the first example of an uninterpreted function in the, in the logic. Once we've gone, once we're in this refinement land, I have no idea what ln means. Okay, it's just all I know are these equalities that are there inside the, inside the logical predicates. Is that a question? Yeah? Sorry. I think his hand was up first, frankly. Yes. Um... The reason I'm pausing is that I think technically the implementation doesn't, but we totally could, because we check termination of everything else. So, uh, so yeah, these would be really trivial to check termination for. Yeah. I'll tell you uh, very precisely what an uninterpreted means in just one, like I think one slide, if I recall carefully. Ah, it is, okay, so yeah. Oh, because you wrote it down. You, uh, this because of this, right? That's how it, you, it knows it. Okay, so is uninterpreted, and so just a sort of a basic logic primer. An uninterpreted function is one that just obeys this one. It's what's called the congruence axiom, right? So f is an uninterpreted function. The only thing you know about f is that for all x and y, if x is equal to y, then f x is equal to f of y. I know nothing else about f. Exactly, so the definition, of, once you're in logic land, you know nothing about the definition of land, other than these little equalities that are in the, in the constraints, okay? And it turns out that the logic doesn't know about it, but the type system knows about it, because remember, we tuck those things inside the constructors, right? And the constructors are now, every time the type system does folds and unfolds, we're gonna, it's gonna assert these facts to the logic, and that, it turns out, is just, is, is just great. That, that's all you need, okay? So the, the, the SMP solver has no problem. So, Every time I do a fold operation, if I say z is equal to cons of x and y, then the type system just rips out, oh, what was the type of c? And it says that z is in fact such that its length is one plus the length of y. Okay, it's just like applying a post condition. And the opposite happens when you do an unfold. So when you do a case, if case z of it was a nil, then this e1 gets checked in an environment where the value, len of v is equal to zero, and otherwise len of v is one plus the len of y where y was the variable you matched against, right? So it's a totally simple hack, but it, it works like a charm, right? So I'm just gonna show you a really simple example 
you can prove that this other length function has the same type as the first length function. That's very exciting. Um, but here's something else you might prove, right? So just re returning over here, I can actually show now that this, this lookup function is not going to crash. If I give it this precondition that this, x, this index that I pass in is less than the length of the list x's, OK? There was a question somewhere there, but the hand has disappeared, so I don't know who it was. Oh. Ah, streams. You're the person with all the difficult questions. Uh, we, I won't get to that in this talk, but we'll talk offline. But we do deal with streams, yeah. Ah, excellent, excellent. Um, the short answer is you pack that inside the definition of the measure. So literally, th does that make sense? So the measure that I showed you, you can actually have a little more sauce in there. Um, but I'm not going to show you very complicated measure definitions. But again, you can, have, you, can, you, you can say if x is in the tail, then the size is still the same as before. right? So imagine a, I want a length function that ignores duplicates. So I would have to write a separate thing that checks for membership. And then I would say if x is a member of the tail, then my length is just the length of the tail. Otherwise, it's 1 plus the length of the tail. That's how you would write. OK. Very well. And the you know, convenient thing, I've, I've, I'm going to cut it out, but you can have multiple measures. You can have length and non-null, and you can have this kind of measure, all for the same kind of data structure. And this is quite handy, because uh, one of my favorite examples, which I will not bore you with, because it's actually quite complicated, um, is a red-black tree, where it turns out you need multiple measures for different invariants. Right? You need one that tracks the number of black nodes along a path. You need another one that tracks the various color facts. Uh, you might have a third one that counts the number of nodes in the tree. And all of these happily coexist and sort of work with each other to, to, to let you get a, a formal guarantee of correctness. OK, I wanted to show you how you can encode various other constraints inside con constructors. Right? It turns out that measures are just one way. But if you start thinking about it, you can start describing various other properties about data structures just by carefully tweaking the types of their constructors. So here's one. So here what I'm doing is it's that same list type, L of A is nil or cons, but what I'm doing is I'm saying that the, in the con cell, the head is some x, which is of type A, and the tail is x's, which is a list of values, all of which are greater than x. Okay? And so what this means is now that the type itself is defining ordered lists. You cannot construct a value of this type if it's not ordered. right? Oh, yes, there's that, which, is, which I'm not showing you over here, right? So A has to have this notion of ordering, exactly. Um, OK, and this specifies increasing lists. And again, the way the machinery works is exactly as before. I'm just going to take the data definition. It gets tapped inside the types of the constructors. And then after that, we're good to go. Okay, we check the property when folding. We assume it when unfolding. And here's a really trivial example. Insertion sort, fold the insert function, starting with the empty list with your input list x's. This is just the usual insert function. And what you can show is that insert sort um, has this particular type, right? It takes a, an arbitrary sort of Haskell list of A's and gives you back an ordered list of A's. Okay, and it's all quite easy. Okay, how am I doing on time? Good God, 10 minutes. Um, okay, well, I said I would tell you about higher order functions, and so now I must. Let's, um, but I won't get to tell you about, okay. So now let me tell you how, how the same machinery scales to you know, closures and callbacks and all that. And the nice thing is actually there's, <laughs> it kind of just works, unlike this apple. Um, so imagine our maps polls visitors, right? And how do we now nicely summarize their behavior? How do we reuse their, their summaries at different calling contexts? It turns out that a lot of these issues of context sensitivity take on a quite an interesting light when you view them in this, uh, you know, through the lens of these type systems. So let's, let's, look at a, a very, let's look at a very concrete example. Okay, so here I'm taking a kind of a, a Haskell-y version of that same higher order loop from before. What's going on is I have a, the loop function takes a low and a high. It takes some base accumulator. And this is the f function. So this is kind of like the reduce from the JavaScript. Okay? What f is doing is it takes an integer, it takes whatever an alpha and gives you back an alpha. You give it a starting alpha, and now it's just going to fold over this range from i through j, starting with your initial alpha, and it gives you back a final alpha. Right? So there's no need to really look at this type, except that what we want to see is like how, 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 how are we going to figure out how this function behaves at different call sites? What's interesting is um, if we look at the refined type of what's happening with f over there. Okay? And that looks something like 
this. Whoa. Actually, look. Yeah, sorry. Oh. Okay. So this was the type of loop. Oh, wait. These slides are all messed up. Hang on. So, can, so what's going to happen with f is that f is only going to get called between values that are between 0. Wait, let's ignore 0. Th there are values that are between low and high. Okay, so really what's happening is this function f is only called between values that are between low and high. And so now, here's a, here's a function which is kind of like the min index function. It, it, instead of computing the minimum index, I'm just adding up all the elements of the array, right? Here's that same body. It takes the current index, i. It takes the current sum of values. And it adds to the current sum, x's at i. And I'm going to take this body, and I'm going to pass it into this loop as a parameter. Okay. So how do I know, given that I'm now taking this random function body and I'm plugging it into the loop, that this index is going to not be out of bounds? Right? How do I glue these two facts together? Well, function typing, subtyping just sort of saved the day for us. Remember that the type of loop that we inferred was that it takes some low and some high and some initial accumulator, and it takes some function f, but it only promises to call that function f on values that are between low and high. Right? So this is the nice thing with function typing. Uh, with, uh, with, with function types, with the, the contracts sort of work in various nice ways for us, right? I'm told that this higher order function, you're giving me this function, but I promise I will only call it between values that are values in the range low and high. And once you do this, at the particular call side over there where, my, where I call loop, low is zero, right? Because that's the parameter I pass in. High is ln of x's, because that's what we just computed, length of x's. And so effectively, the body is only called with values that are between 0 and ln x's. And so I know that this value i is only between 0 and ln x's, which is why it's all safe. Right? And all of this works essentially by the same machinery as we saw before. Instead of just using vanilla a implies b as your subtyping, what we're going to use is function subtyping as your way of checking if one value flows to another. Okay? So let's look at yet another example. OK, well, that sort of builds on this, which is polymorphic instantiation. How do I take a summary, such as the description that I got from a loop, and how do I plug in its behavior at a particular call site? Okay, So what we'll see is this is a, 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 an interesting form of context sensitivity. So um, imagine I want to sum up all the elements of a list x's. And what I'm told is I have a list of nats, and I want to add them all up. How do I know that I get back a nat? Okay. And the way I'm doing it is I'm, just, I'm, not, I'm not doing it in the classical way where I loop over the values one by one. I'm doing it in the modern way where I use this fold or reduce function. Okay, so fold with the plus operator, the initial accumulator is 0, and then I just stream over the x's. So how do I know that I get back a nat? Here's what happens. This is what the type of fold is. Okay, it takes an accumulator, the next element in your collection, and it gives you back an accumulator. You give it a starting value of your accumulator, a list of objects of your collection, and you get back an accumulator, right? This is just the vanilla type of fold. But now what's going to happen is at this particular call site, this, this function type is going to behave in, in an interesting way, right? That's governed by what's happening at this call site. In particular, alpha and beta can be instantiated with nat. OK, so what, we can, what the system is going to figure out is that at this particular call site, alpha and beta are not just integers, but they're nats. OK, and so what's going to happen is, um, it's going to check that the concrete function that you plus passed in, which is the plus operator, which has the type x int, y int, and you get back a value that's equal to x plus y, is a subtype of nat, arrow, nat, arrow, nat. Right? Because every time you pass in a parameter, you want to check subsumption between what is expected at the call site and what is actually being passed in at the call site. So I'm passing in a plus, and is plus, in fact, of type nat, arrow, nat, arrow, nat. And this is just, you know, it's like decades old uh, type system with a standard rule for function subtyping. You want to check if one function is a subtype of another. You simply flip the parameters, and you'll check the outputs in, the, in a, a covariant style. right? So it boils down to checking if nat is a subtype of int, you, because you flip the inputs. And then you check that, assuming the stronger type for the inputs, the output type of the first function is, in fact, subsumed by the output type of the second function. And all of these are, again, just those simple first order SMT queries that the SMT solver just chews up for breakfast. Really straightforward. Yes, question? Yeah. No, you can have you can have all you can have much more complicated assertions. I'm just using these for this talk. Yeah. 
The short answer is right now we model it very inaccurately. Uh, we model it in a kind of logical way, but that's, that has nothing to do with our system. Because, you, I mean, very concretely, I could just, it's a matter of switching the Z3 or uh, the SMT knob from use infinite sort of precision integers to 64-bit integers or 32-bit, right? So that's, that's entirely parametric. That's That's right. Then your types will get much more complicated because you have to worry about overflow. So I'm, I'm sort of eliding all that in this particular talk. But we're actually doing, um, I mean, it's funny you should mention that because there's a project we're working on now where we're using this to actually generate C code where you want to make sure that certain values do not overflow. And in those cases, we're actually putting, you know, these stronger types in. And it's, it works out pretty, it, it's not bad. Okay? Okay, fantastic. Um, are we, can I get like, oh, I still have five minutes. Or have I gone? Up? What's that? Two, two, three minutes? Okay, fantastic. I'll just um, blah, blah, blah. Okay, fantastic. And so some NATs get verified quite easily, right? You just, by instantiating alpha and beta to NAT. Oh, let me just tell you why alpha and beta got instantiated to NAT, because I'm sure you will ask this question. And I should have at least one question of yours that I should answer. And the point I want to emphasize here is that the way they get instantiated to NAT is exactly the same way we've seen before, which is like so. So right, this kind of polymorphism happens everywhere in a, in a modern language. Right? No, I don't want you to have to write down, oh, instantiate alpha with this over here and instantiate beta with that. We're not in Java anymore. Um, so what I'm going to say is, at any call site, the underlying type system is going to say, aha, I see over here you're instantiating alpha with an integer. And I see you're instantiating beta with some other integer. And so I'm going to pretend that it's an integer such that some k alpha. And I'm going to pretend that it's an integer such that some k beta. Okay, and once you do that, everything, the type of the accumulator becomes k alpha, arrow k beta, arrow k alpha, and so on and so forth. And then you essentially just turn the, turn the, sub, uh, the, the type checking crank, and you get these horn constraints, and you solve it out, and you get this nice solution for k, which is just an alpha. Okay, let me just, um, since I have to finish now, let me end, before going to my conclusion slides, let me just leave you with, what I thought was one of these really vexing problems. It's a, it's a kind of context sensitivity issue, but let me show it to you nevertheless. So here's a function, it's a really trivial function, but it really is de describes the essence of the kinds of problems that you face when you want to deal with higher order code. Imagine I want to write a function that just adds two numbers, okay? And of course, you could just write n plus m, but I'm gonna do it in this convoluted style. I'm gonna call loop, starting with the low value of zero and the high value of m and the initial value of n. And in each iteration, I'm just going to bump up the value by one. Okay, so I mean, obviously, this is a contrived example, right? But it, 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 it sort of distills the essence of things we've seen. I want to be able to show that after doing this complicated thing, the result that I get is, in fact, equal to m plus n. It should be, right? I started at n, and I bumped it up m times. How do I show that the result at the end is equal to m plus n? Okay? And the reason why this is a really vexing problem is that I need, you know, I don't know how this, this particular property only holds at the very last iteration. So it's, I need some kind of loop invariant, but I don't want the invariant for loop to talk about addition because it's a higher order function. It should somehow be independent of the specific computation. I only want to talk about f, right? And yet I wanted to de depend on the loop invariant, right? So this was a particularly vexing problem. And if I had another R, I guess I'd tell you how we solved it, or another 20 minutes, but I don't. So we can talk about it offline. Instead, let me just tell you about some of the results that we have, which are, which are quite nice, right? So this is a pretty real system. As soon as this damn thing, ah, I saw the window. Chrome, come back to me, maybe. View, exit presentation. Oh, wow, look at that. Um, I think it's, let's just cut to the end, right? Evaluation, yeah, so I just, you know, this is a, it's a pretty real system that we built at this point. Um, oh, God. View, 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 exit presentation. I'll just show it to you like so. Hope that the fonts are large enough. Okay. Oh, fantastic. Okay, cool. Um, so we've actually, you know, we built a system s for several years. I, I, want, I want real programmers to use it, and um, that's a kind of double-edged sword, but it's actually starting to happen. Um, so we've thrown it at about 10,000 lines of Haskell libraries, which in, in classical terms is like about 100,000 lines of C because they're really dense. Um, there's a whole story about modules that I didn't tell you about. So these 10,000 lines are scattered across about 50 different modules. 
And we've looked at a variety of pretty complicated properties. So I put memory safety here, and usually when I go Haskell memory safety, what's there to check? It turns out there's a lot to check, because every modern language is actually built on top of C. And so you can make Haskell program seg fault quite easily, if you're not very careful. Um, but sort of ranging all the way from memory safety to functional correctness of data structures, and actually termination. One of the other things we do check, for reasons I'm not going to get into now, is that you want to make sure all functions terminate, and we check all of that. Um, inference is quite crucial, so there's about 10,000-odd you know, 10, libraries. It's pretty fast. It's, um, this time doesn't look so great. It's about, I don't know, one second per 10 lines of code. But in fact, you can use it in a kind of reactive way while you're programming, and so it's, it's, it's pretty good. Um, and that's, well, that's pretty much it. I promise, Martin, that I will now get to coffee. God knows I want it more than you do. Um, the upshot is that th the whole point of this work is that you can, if you sort of add types into this mixture of logic and analysis, it actually lets you do very interesting things where logic and analysis alone were getting, were, were at least as far as I could see, getting quite blocked. Um, and that's pretty much it. All you do is generalize properties to predicates and types proofs become BCs plus subtyping, and inference just becomes uh, abstract interpretation and Hindley-Milner. Types are fantastic. Did I just say that already? Um, there's lots of fun future work, but Martin is getting pretty desperate. And so, I will conclude right now. Thank you. Oh, fantastic. Let's so your modern language is not both functional, right? It's functional. So as soon as you add a heat, like the Mata, for instance, you need to deal with framing, and you get heat and air quantifiers to talk about all the heat locations, or you need separating conjunction, like a separation logic. So how do you imagine you would extend that to a uh, I actually, uh, we've done a fair bit of work on this, as it turns out. I didn't talk about it here. You're absolutely right. So you have to talk about the heat. Um, instead of using, instead of using um, against, we, you use, we, we use some form of separation logic, but the form I like is something called alias types, which was, I think, another kind of proto-separation logic, where, again, you get a, a lot of very nice syntactic type discipline for describing collections. Um, okay, I can, I can talk about it offline, but yes, you, get, you have to deal with the heap, you have to deal with separating conjuncts, but actually it's quite pleasant um, as long as you limit yourself to certain structures. I mean, if you're arbitrarily sharing, then all bets are wrong. Right? But as long as you limit yourself to certain nice structures, uh, then you don't have explicit quantifiers. And again, the time system can do a lot more work for you. I guess we will go. OK, sorry. Um, so the more complicated the type get, the more complicated the error part is. So what it, 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 the program doesn't have check, what do you do? Do you just, uh, how easy is it to fix? Do you jump a VP saying, well, somewhere in here, something? Um, you will notice on this slide. Oh, to okay. me, this is like, the, this is the, Okay, but I'm going to get on the soapbox for just another second. The single most important problem to solve in static analysis is error messages. I'm, I'm just, you know, I didn't say this 10 years ago, but I'm going to say this now, and I believe it. And the reason for this is, the more complicated your analysis is, the harder it is to explain when it fails. It's just, it, this, just this weird tension there, right? And obviously, we want better, more precise analyses, but then if the analysis dies, then ah, how do I explain it? And frankly, we don't have a good story for it. Right now, we have the line number, and you know, there's a little squiggly line, and it comes up really fast. But I don't know a good way to explain this. I wish I had some nice answer. We give you a little bit of a context. But really, it's often, I think yesterday I was making this talk. Actually, let me give you a very concrete On the fly, I was making this talk. I put in all these places where, the type, where there's a type error, right? I was like, oh my god, why is there a type error here? These little red lines, right? Because the talk is actually generated by the tool. How the hell do I fix this? Why? It says over there, fix this error. I just see the red line go away. But I was like, how do I fix this? I can't remember. And then I was just like a monkey. Let's just try other parameters. Oh, look, it works. Uh, so yeah, I wish I had a better answer again. But I guess I confess. Yeah? Oh. Yeah, sorry. I mean, I think maybe uh, this is a place where the program syntax actually helps. So there's control. Yes. So the way that you get these type, uh, the predicates in the type, is because of inference done over a body of text. Mm -hmm. In that body of text, you could maybe highlight the flow yes. that led to this. So the program has an intuition about what runtime flows might be. Exactly. exactly. And there's the kind of thing that actually uh, Peter talked about yesterday, where you have these sort of provenances of where information got lost. So things like that, I think, would be extremely useful.
I mean, the, the, the real challenge is when you try to prove properties like in order to prove x, you often have to prove x and y. And the hard part is figuring out what the hell y is. That's, that's often the real aspect. Um, so, how do you, do you ever run into issues where there's analysis just hangs out, or is it just because you, I think the logic you're dealing with is that all, I guess, so then you hardly ever get this wrong, or? There is, the, um, the way we use the SMT solver is extremely predictable, and it is done so by design. There are no for-alls anywhere. I have to constantly keep fighting my students who are always trying to sneak for-alls in while I'm not looking. Um, and the reason is precisely the range of checking, super predictable, right? So, um, yeah, it only turns out because of a bug in my code. You know, I had some, there was some stack overflow about the conversion, but not because of the logic. Yeah? So on the topic of for-alls, I mean, if you go back to the classical pro programs, as you said, in your introduction, I guess for alls come up all the time, right? And fools, 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 quantifiers. Ah. Oh, for alls. Ah, yes, yes. So I write an array, and I, I want the invariant that the array has no duplicates. I don't see that you're going to so easily express this without quantifiers. And even in cases where you can express this as an inductive property, which you bake into the data type, it's not always easier to reason about in a program which jumps around the array if you have an inductive definition instead of a quantified one. So to what extent is the, I mean, on the other hand, so I, I like the types very much, right? I like the formalization, and it seems for the higher order style of programming, you have a very natural way of specifying like, how, you, how you reason maybe about closures in general, I don't know. So to what extent is the, is the absence of quantifiers really an element of the design, or could you just put the quantifiers back in if you were willing? You, you could at any point you could put the quantifiers back in, right? Okay. It's just it's really as a kind of uh, that's not the right word to use in polite circles. Um, it, it's, as a form, I, I want to see how far we can get without actually slipping the quantifiers in. Okay. But to get back to your thing, in fact, you can describe things like the absence of duplicates in the inductive world. We haven't looked so hard at the at the array world just yet. Well, as it happens, in the half of the talk that I did not describe contains exactly examples of this kind. How do you describe very precise things about arrays that are, you know, every element between 0 and 10 is actually between 0 and 10, or elements in this range are uninitialized, and so on and so forth. I'm happy to show you that offline, because I didn't get to it here. But it turns out you can actually push this very, very far. Um, I didn't get to talk about it here. But there, there will always be certain things that you cannot say. And I, think it, I think it's really interesting, but just as a throwaway remark, I don't think Winston's the only one who can implement quantifiers. I think, oh, I think it's not, it's not a disaster to put them back in, as far as I understand, but maybe I'm wrong. It's, 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 it's a black art. Uh, yeah. There are a few people who get it. I have a question about, you know this, uh, this pure functional data structure by Okasaki, right? Yeah. Yeah. Have you, I mean, oh, yeah, 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 that was in one of those benchmarks. Yeah. We yeah. checked a bunch of different kinds of properties. Yeah. For them. Yeah. And the other thing is, I mean, the predicate, we talk about the predicate, predicate abstraction, I know in your work earlier, right? Coming up with a predicate is actually part of every fragment and all that kind of thing. Here you basically just give the logic of fragments and then the, the, the solver just imposes the predicate. So you have to give the predicate. So what we found, uh, so I, I did not want to get into okay. the whole refining, figuring out what the predicates are. Partly because I was like, well, we just write them down. And if you write them down in this nice sketchy style where you just have stars everywhere, then it actually gets you, pretty much does what you want. So that's one. And two that we found is that if you just scrape the predicates from the uh, specifications, mm -hmm. that gets you like 98% of the way. So like in, in fact, not knowing the predicates is very, very rarely a problem. That's basically like in the, in the slam and you just get the yeah. problem. Yeah, exactly. You don't, yeah. So all that stuff, you know, influential people just read that stuff. <laughs> 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 anyway. Cool. Yeah, last question. Yeah. So um, could you say a bit more about, you know, you picked a particular constraint system in the town. Ah, yes. That you quantify it. The, the refinements, for the refinements, That's yes, it. yes. Uh, could you say a bit more about that choice? Could I have chosen one of a million varieties? You, it would not be no problem. Or you could. Uh, so you could, all, all you really want from the constraint system is some form of inclusion, some notion of inclusion, that this implication, if you wish, uh, does x imply y, and some form of substitution. Uh, because you know when you at, at function calls really you're plugging in these parameters, right? So as long as you can basically put in any logic or any constraint system you like, as long as it has some kind of substitution and and some notion of implication. That's pretty much it. Okay, let's thank uh, Jit again.